you in now. So let, let, let's make a start. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Brian Runciman. I'm Head of Content and Insight at PTS, Charles Institute for IT, and I'm really pleased to, uh, to welcome Julian Schwartzman back today. Uh, hi, Julian. Yep. Uh, hi, Brian. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks. And yourself? I well, I hope. And, and Mark Humphries as well. Let me introduce Mark. Uh, Mark, welcome. Hi, Brian. Nice to meet you. So we're, we're talking today about uh, data management, um, specifically being a data-driven organisation. What are some of the difficulties? Now, obviously, this is a massive question. Uh, we have about 30 minutes uh, of talk time, then we usually have 15 minutes Q&A. Please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box at the moment. I'm sure you all know how that works now. Uh, it's there at the bottom of your screen. Put questions in there if you'd like to. We've already had one coming actually through email, which we'll bring up shortly. And one of the uh, ideas behind this session too is just to whet the appetite uh, for the upcoming uh, data management uh, conference, uh, which we're, we're very excited to be involved with as well. In fact, just to set the scene, Julian, can we ask you a little bit about the conference? Just set the scene there for us as to how we're gonna go into it a bit deeper later. Yeah, certainly. I mean, um, so my role as chair of the BCS Data Management Specialist Group, um, we run various data related events throughout the year. And one thing that we've historically done is we've always had a one day event, normally in June, where we've run as a joint event with Dharma UK, and that's where Mark Humphreys is from. Um, and we've picked a topic, had an event, uh, attendees from both organisations come along, and normally it's been a really good event. Uh, last year, we were well into the planning for the event. COVID came along, lockdown came along. And so we had a, a bit of a choice of do we cancel or do we maybe convert to some kind of virtual conference? And that we chose the latter and went for a virtual conference. Rather than trying to cram everything into a very heavy day, we spread it out over a week. So we got 10 webinars over a week so at 11 o'clock and 4 p.m. each day. So that then meant it was much easier for people to fit it around their working day and get, get sort of involved in that way and mix and match in terms of the, the content we're going for. And so we've, in effect, it, that was a great success and we're repeating that this year. So we've got 10 webinars coming up, 11 o'clock and 4 p.m. each day from the 14th to the 18th of June. And in terms of the content and speakers, we'll, we'll come on to that a little bit as the, as the conversation goes on. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, so there's loads of good speakers because uh, I've obviously seen the agenda and you can see it too. It's on the BCS events website. I don't mind pointing. I'm pointing at one of my screens. Uh, so please uh, have a look at the BCS events website for more details on that. But let's, let's start a conversation about some of these issues too, as I say, whet the appetite. We'll just start with uh, this question. Perhaps I can come to you, Mark, uh, first. Why are organisations now just taking more interest in their data? What's the, what's the motivating force? Um, well, part of it is because there is so much more data out there and it's all part of you know, a shift which has been happening for a long time, the, the, you know, the shift to digital. Um, mm -hmm. if, you, you know, if you're delivering your services, your products, your communications to, to your customers or to citizens um, online, then you're, you're naturally collecting a lot more data um, and a lot more data is being collected on all of us. And, and you know, that gives you insight. So one of the things, it gives you insight. So you know, why would you... Why, why would you make? Why, why would you manage by by guesswork or, or whatever um, when you can actually get some some insight into um, how the world is really working, how how customers or citizens are, are actually accessing and using your services? Um, insight into what you do well, what you do um, badly, um, you know, and and basically using all that data to to make better decisions, to make clearer decisions, uh, and so on, to drive to drive policy, to drive um, you know. Uh, Operations, you know, operational decisions. So decision making at all levels, um, right from you know where should we be spending our money in, in investment terms, um, right down to um, you know actually what should I what should I be doing to to optimize my day or to optimize my workforce um, to achieve everything we need to do today. Yeah, very good. Now, I, one of the um, issues, possibly then, is is the amount of data, isn't it? So people are at different stages on their transformation journey. If they're at the very beginning and they look at all the data in their organization, it looks massive. It's a really intimidating edifice. Where does one start, Julian? I think the first thing to start with, and I think just to build on what Mark was saying just now, I think one of the other challenges for organizations is that in the past, there's been a belief that technology will solve the problem. And I think what we now have in most organizations is each person, each thing, is represented in multiple data stores. And those data stores aren't necessarily linked, they don't necessarily agree with each other. And so this challenge of managing and understanding this growing 
complexity of data is is an interesting challenge for all. Um, um, it's something that Mark and I and, and others in the data profession have been trying to encourage organisations for many years to take a more data driven focus on what they're doing to balance data to technology. So I think for me, one of the, the challenges is maybe to develop a bit of a strategy and start a little bit more organically, changing some of the beliefs and behaviours around data to recognise that this is something that needs to be managed and that, um, that you need to actually think about this in sort of in, as a balance. So one analogy that's been used around data is the fact that IT run the equivalent of, they create the warehouse, they've got the shelves, the racking, all the machines mm -hmm. to get stuff on and off the shelves. It's down to the business to decide what they want to put on the shelves. And we're in a similar kind of situation here where IT create the infrastructure, the framework, and the business very often is responsible for what they put in that framework. Um, and if the data is good enough that it doesn't make the infrastructure fall over, so the IT applications don't crash, then IT typically are okay with that, even though that might create all sorts of problems for the organization. And so the place to start very often is start by trying to understand what, what data you've got, what data you need, then look at trying to get some requirements in, in a more formalized way and then starting building from there. And just looking ahead to the conference, one of the speakers we've got, in fact, our first speaker is Bethan Charnley from the um, DCMS, who's looking at the implementation of the national data strategy. So I think that's mm. sort of at a, at a wider level, a very clear step forward saying that we actually need to have a data strategy. We need as a nation to get a lot better at how we do data. And so her role in terms of implementing that, I think is going to be key. And as an opening presentation within our conference, I think that's a really good opener. Excellent. That's interesting. So obviously the first things that come to mind are, are the, uh, the the legal terms of how you run your data, how, how you got it in the first place. All, all that sort of thing comes into mind, doesn't it, Mark? So presumably there's a lot of um, cross-organisational communication that needs to happen before you decide what data is even usable. Would that be fair? What data is usable and, and what you can and can't use it for. Um, you know, that's it's a huge um, topic amongst um, pretty much everyone I speak to um, in, in the public sector um, is, is what can we do with our data? So there's a there's a general um, there's a general understanding and, and appreciation within the public sector that um, there is huge potential in, in terms of sharing data um, in terms of delivering, um, you know, delivering public services better. Um, you know, and, and avoiding having to people having to constantly tell you all everything that they believe you already know about them anyway. You know, so, mm. so joined up joined up delivery of services is a really important thing. Um, and and um, I think you know one of the another one of the the talks we'll have is from from Neil Crump from um, Dudley Group NHS Trust, mm. who, who will who, who will walk us through um, some of their experiences from um, delivering public services, delivering health services during the pandemic. Um, and how they've managed to share data with, with across different organizations um, to deliver um, you know, the best possible care they can for, for their communities um, you know, under pressure, uh, both in terms of time and, and, and um, resources available. Um, but on the other aspect, you know, there is this, this, this large, large topic about you know, what you can and can't share. Um, and a lot of people are very confused about this because it is, it is complex um, and sometimes legislation would appear to um, be going in different directions. On, on the one hand, there are data privacy um, laws which say what, you know, you, 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 you know, people interpret often wrongly that you need consent for everything. Um, on the other hand, you've got um, duty of care type obligations um, where, you know, if you know that somebody, um, you know, has an allergy to something, then you, may, you need to make sure you don't give them uh, medicines which are going to trigger a, 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 an allergic reaction. If you're not sharing that information, um, then you're failing in your duty of care. And then this sort of goes into the whole you know, much bigger sphere of, of ethics, what you can and can't do. There's, there's the legal side of things, but also the ethical side of things. Um, mm. We've got another talk from, from Catherine O'Keefe, who, who's one of the leading experts in, uh, in data ethics about, you know, when, when, you know, when ethics hits, when ethics hits the ground, you know, what, how does it work in practice? So I think she's going to give us some, some really useful practical advice um, on, on applying ethical principles to to using and sharing data. I mean, that's going to be of huge interest, isn't it? BCS are very keen, as, as, as you both know, uh, on, on the ethical dimension of these things. I mean, a, an example that always comes to my mind when we discuss this is uh, that bank um, banking organisations often know if somebody's got um, onset dementia from the way that they behave when they put their details into 
uh, web forms or even bank machines. So that's kind of emergent information that's not the sort of almost indirectly available. Is, is that the sort of grey area that's going to be looked at, Julian? Um, yeah, I think that is one of those uh, clear cases where, if you like, a, a spin-off of using data for one purpose may provide mm. insights into another one. And then there, there are the questions there around the ethical angle of, is it ethical to share that information? Because that's actually quite sensitive information. Um, and so if a bank war or a financial institution was looking to do something along those lines, they would need to get some clear consent beforehand to allow them to do that. So it does get into quite an interesting minefield there. But I think also in terms of the sharing angle, there is the challenge around structure, about trying to make sure that we've got data in common formats or similar formats that will allow us to bring things together. Um, so that's the structural angle before you get to the ethical angle and the security angle. And I think one of the areas on the structural side, as well as backing on the national data, data strategy, we've got one of our speakers is Mark Enzer, who has uh, got multiple roles. One of it is working with the Centre for Digital Built Britain about the programmes come up with the national digital twin of how do we actually try and make sure for the built environment we're bringing together our data and we can actually get gain some insights from that in a way that is appropriate, is secure, um, and we've got the right mechanics in place there. But also on the Wednesdays, we've got two infrastructure-related pre presenters on the Wednesday of the, of the virtual conference, is uh, Karen Olford from the Environment Agency. So they've been doing a huge amount of work bringing together a number of their data sets to try and make sure they've got clear requirements defined, they've got clear structure for how the data is put together. And so that is one of the key ways forward is understanding the structural side, which then gets into, once you've got the structural side sorted out, then the ethical questions then start to come into the fore of just because we can join this data together in these ways and use it in, in new purposes, is it actually appropriate to do so? Yeah, and, and one of the one of the things that we, we mentioned before we came on was um, about the benefits of data sharing being quite obvious, but it's so difficult to do in practice. Um, Mark, would you like to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. You know, sharing data in practice is is really really difficult, um, and part of that is down to um, concerns about may I share this, and, and 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 you know, am I allowed to share this? Am I not allowed to share it? Um, you know, and how and interpreting the rules and. Um, this actually sort of taps into one of my great frustrations with um, my fellow data management professionals, if I'm honest. Um, you know, I, time and time again, I, I, I see people coming and saying, you know, what am I allowed to do with my data? And then what I see the, the data management um, community doing is just parroting back the legislation and say, you know, well, well, here's GDPR. And GDPR says you need a lawful basis and you've got to pick one of these lawful bases. Um, and I really think that what we should be doing as a, as a profession is, is adding value here in terms of interpreting that and saying, instead of saying, instead of just parroting back uh, word for word, this is what GDPR says, or this is what um, the Caldecott um, guidelines say for healthcare data and things, um, you know, actually saying, right, what is it you do? Okay, right, in that case, given what you're doing, here is a lawful basis which you should be doing. That lawful basis comes with these things. So you need to provide an opt out for example, if, if, for example, you're using something like legitimate interest. Okay. So yes, you can do it. You need to tell people you're doing it, um, but you need to give them an opt out option in this case. You know, giving them concrete guidelines in 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 in, in those situations, um, rather than um, you know just like I say, parroting the, the thing. I think you know, this is this is our opportunity as a profession, to be honest. Um, to, to join the gaps between what people are doing, what they want to do, um, and, and, and what they, they can and should, and, and actually providing that in, interpretation for them. There, there was a, a customer I was, I was talking to um, uh, a few months back, and she was saying um, that you know, within local government, she was, she was, she was, she'd been told she couldn't share, um, in, in, a, in a data sharing agreement, she, she was unable to share um, someone's gender um, because um, she didn't have consent to do that. And, and, you know, and she was she was really getting very, very frustrated because nobody was going to actually take a decision one way or the other. You know, can we share gender? Yes or no. You know, and it, it, it was it, all people would do was just keep quoting back legislation after and she was none the wiser. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, like I said, that's an opportunity for us um, yeah. to actually add value there. Building on Mark's statement there, I think yeah, our, our challenge as data professionals, so using an analogy of somebody saying, I want to go to the top of that mountain. Mark's analogy was almost there, somebody throwing a, an ordnance survey map at somebody saying, there's the map, off you go. Mm -hmm. And actually, we need to be much more become the guides. 
So we, 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 we shared the map between us and we actually helped plan the route. And as you're going along that route, obstacles arise. The data professionals need to be there to actually help say, okay, we've got this obstacle. Um, this is how we can work our way around it in a legal way. And so that, I think, is part of the challenge we've got as a profession is trying to get a little bit more engaged with what organisations are doing and not just, as Mark was saying, just parroting the legislation back at people. So you're talking about having a data Sherpa, basically. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, one of the things people may, may be familiar that I've used the concept of the data zoo for many years. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually, data Sherpa isn't one isn't a, isn't a character we've got in there. But actually, it's a good idea, Brian. I'll, I'll credit you a bit later. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, add that one in. <laughs> a little picture of me with a hat. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Jimmy. It's one of the problems here that um, obviously this is fairly new emerging area that we've got now. The capability to manipulate the amount of data that is is around. Um, is, is there not much case law to actually inform interpretation or, or is there loads? I, I, I don't really know, basically. Mark, have you a view on that? Um, I've, I've not. Um, case law is, isn't really my um, area of expertise. So I'm, I'm not aware of much case law. Um, but I think and, and what, what, I, what I do do from time to time is um, review the, the ICO's website and see um, uh, who, they're, who they're awarding fines to and, and why they're awarding fines. Um, and what I find there is, um, from, from that point of view, because these, these are this is the regulator. So, um, as well as understanding legislation, it's also important to understand how the regulator interprets that in that in, in practice. Um, and, and that's a kind of that's a useful way of of finding out what you know where you should really concentrate and what the real risks are, are to you as an organisation. And the two things that stand out there for me when when I see what the ICO does, um, the two things they they issue big fines for. Um, one is um, if really negligent criminal activity. Um, so, you know, we're talking about people who uh, who, who abuse um, personal data and they, they're constantly um, calling you up, trying to sell you things when, you know, you, you, know, you, you have given, you clearly have given no consent or you're on the do not contact list. Um, you know, that willful abuse um, of, of personal data is one thing they come down on very hard and quite rightly so. Um, so if you're not, you know, if you're not engaged in willful abuse, then you, you're already covered from the, in terms of the biggest risk. Um, and the second thing they come down hard on is um, uh, technical negligence. So, um, you know, where, where hacks, where data breaches have occurred um, because patches haven't been applied to servers and, and patches for vulnerabilities that have known, you know, been known about for two years or, or more and, and those servers haven't been patched. And, and that is effectively um, technical negligence. And they come down hard on that. So. If, if you're looking at, you know, what are the biggest risks in terms of the, the regulator, I'd say those are the two things. It's like, you know, don't go around abusing data and, and very few, organi certainly the organizations I deal with don't go around doing that. Um, but then make sure you're on top of that, that technical um, management and, and keeping, your, keeping everything, keeping your infrastructure up to date and as secure as you can. So that was one of the questions we were going to discuss, wasn't it? You know, is, is technology part of the solution in and of itself? And so the first basics are security hygiene. Yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah, I, I think the, the security side there is not just, it, it's a little bit wider than cybersecurity. Some of, the, some of the work I do in the built environment is, is working with very complex supply chains on a large infrastructure project. You will be sharing detailed information with that supply chain. So there needs to be some much more sort of security minded thinking around what are we sharing? What is sensitive? What have we got concerns about? Whether it's either a thing that we're concerned about, so we need to be careful about the data about that one thing, or maybe there's a strand of information that is either intellectual property or has got some other security-related risks, and so we need to think very, very carefully how we're sharing that. And I think it does does fit in very, very nicely. And um, that you you need to think, you need to have a much more conscious, structured approach to this. So, using the, your analogy of data sherpa again, I think it's. It's, it's not just saying it's about patches, it's about saying these are the ways that we should be helping guide organisations to the point where they understand how they can do this in a safe and secure way. Going to the point about, I mentioned earlier about the National Digital Twin, and that is one of the concerns there about having this, if you like, distributed architecture where there's information about physical assets that potentially can be shared across organisations. That does present security risk, and that is one of the key areas that has been focused on by the Centre for Digital Built Britain, is to try and make sure that just because we're allowing uh, data to be shared and combined and analysed in this way, that we're not allowing people to do it inappropriately. So we don't allow either 
the wrong actors in to look at the data or people we've got a legitimate need to use the data, but they may be going in sort of straying over the boundary of what they're allowed to do. Yeah, interesting. Let's turn to a question. We've had a question come in uh, just on, on the Q&A here from uh, Andrew Black. So uh, please send other questions in. We've got another one to come to you later. But this one is quite specific. I just, just want to put it. My wife, my wife works in an SEN role and finds conflicts between data protection and child protection um, requirements. That's a very specific one, but is, is that quite common, Mark, that, there, that there's conflicts between different standards, different approaches? It is, and I would imagine that um, that's a really good example where um, when she's looking for advice, um, people are just quoting legislation at her. Uh, and, and, I, and this is where I think, you know, actually where we, we should be adding value as data management professionals is, is in, interpreting guidelines. And I think one of the things with, um, I think generally people are, are um, they're very risk averse. And so the mm -hmm. default reaction is, is, is not to share data. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you're working in special needs education uh, or special education needs, um, then I think, you know, one of the things is uh, I, I would encourage organizations, so encourage schools, local authorities, et cetera, to have a policy um, because people on the front line, um, uh, like, like the question, like the, the question of the wife, um, you know, she, she's faced with this reality on a, on a day to day basis. And, and she's no doubt concerned about what her personal liabilities. So she, I, I believe she has a right to, to have clear guidelines of you know how those how those different obligations um, complement and, and compete with each other and, and and which one trumps which so she's got clear guidelines in terms of under these circumstances actually um, you do need to share that and, and, and actually the, the local authority has a responsibility um, to put those data sharing agreements in place so that you know we do share information on those places and and parents um, have, a, have a right to, to to be able to access those policies so so it, it's clear to her. I think one of the things which you know if i would really like to see is is just more openness with everyone saying this is what this is the information we share this is why we share it okay um but that requires a little bit of thought um you know thought about what it is we're doing why we're doing it and just being open about that and, and if you again if you if you look at the guidance from from the ico one of the things they really want to see from all of us is clear guidelines show us you're working is one of their one of their stock phrases if you can explain what it is you're doing and why you're doing it, what your rationale is, um, the very worst that can happen to you from the ICO in practice is you get a slap, slap wrist because they go, actually, we disagree on the details of some of this, um, but they're not going to whack you with, with a great big fine um, if, you've, if you've made a, an honest mistake. And, you know, in, like I say, you've shown you're working. One of the worst things you can do is, is just kind of not take a decision, not take a position, not develop um, a policy. Yeah. I think also that there's, there's a balance to be struck here and, 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 and you're trying to go, get the balance right. So on the one hand, you could very easily say, OK, each of these data stores, they've got a very limited usage. We're going to restrict who uses them. We won't share information either within or outside the organisation. So that actually is quite an easy decision to make. It's quite a cheap decision to run from an IT security and data perspective. But the on cost to the organization of the inefficiencies it creates is massive. If you go to the other side and say, we'll actually spend a huge amount of time identifying all the possible sharing operations we can do, develop a very complex security model that will allow everybody to be given a specific role that gives them all the right sharing for their role. You've then got the area where you can potentially allow huge amount of flexibility for the organization, but the actual security admin task looking after that starts to come a lot higher. So across the two, there's a bit of kind of a balance and organizations I think need to be a little bit more aware that it is a balance. They need to be thinking about what are the costs of the approach we've got, but also what are the potential benefits? Are we at the right point? So the easiest binary solution of, we don't share information, we're not going to integrate these systems, easy decision to make potentially, but actually can have a quite a big knock-on effect for, for what could be quite a large organisation with quite big impacts on the uh, outputs of that organisation. Mm, absolutely. Uh, we had um, a couple of comments in here. Nigel Holden has just uh, mm. sent a little text to me saying there is no conflict between child projection and GDPR, and I know it's very carefully covered. That's probably just the way I phrase the question, Nigel, to be honest with you. So uh, 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 that's down to me. But he, he asked an interesting question, which maybe brings into focus this idea about the balance between risk aversion and, and, and um, where we should go with that. It, he asks, 
is there or should there be a bigger drive to only working with ISO 27001 accredited supply chains? We'd like to pick that one up. Mark looks keen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so a lot of the a lot of the work that um, that, that we do at Civica um, is, is public sector, and more and more um, we see this as a as a standard clause um, in in the in procurement. Um, you know, we must be ISO twenty seven thousand and one um, compliant, and we need to, to show that. So I think um, that is becoming um, as I said, becoming a default, um, uh, and it's it's one way of of mitigating risk. So yes. But I think actually I, I could build on that is that I think in other contexts, the built environment, smart cities, things of that nature, you are dealing with a, a more complex environment and the what, what's described in what's specified in 27,001 is perhaps not flexible enough or not suitable for that environment. And that's where ISO 19650 part five, which is the BIM related security standard and PAS 185, which is security related uh, smart cities standard, those two provide guidance there. And again, I mentioned earlier about the security-minded approaches, and it is very much about trying to get that security-minded approach, taking a risk-based approach to what are we sharing with who, what controls we've got in place, what governance have we got in place for when things potentially go wrong, that we actually know how we're going to respond in a particular situation. So um, that, I think, that 27,000, I think, gives you a base, but for certain in context, you need to be thinking wider than that, being thinking a little bit more carefully about what are we sharing with whom and what are the risks that might arise from that. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Nigel just sent a little message in. He, he's the ex head of technology policy for the ICO. So, uh, Nigel, send more uh, difficult questions in for the panel. More than happy to. <laughs> I'm not going to have to answer them, so that's okay. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, uh, John Ryan sent an interesting question. This is not BCS oriented, uh, Julian, so I'm going to point this towards you. Given the, the amount of conflicts of interest that are now arising, should the BCS review its educational requirements to include more about the way the law operates in this country, including contract torts, uh, some specific IT related uh, topics like that? Do you have any views on that? Um, yes, I think I'll actually take that a little bit wider. I think within the IT sector, and I think BCS is probably a little bit guilty of this as well, there is sometimes too much of a focus on the technology, the software. And there is not necessarily enough focus on the application of the technology, thinking about the all everything that we, we, we need to make a, a technology solution work. So one of the things that I regularly um, talk about and trying to get a bit passionate about, and I'll try not to get too much on my, my soapbox here, is about trying to get a rel the appropriate balance between data, process, technology, and people. And I think for many organizations, the process has been if we buy this best of breed software, the salespeople tell us it's going to be wonderful, it's going to solve all our problems. That's all we need to do. Missing the fact that there are some data issues they've already got, the technology can't solve. There may be some process and behavioral issues that need sorting out as well. So I think there needs to be a balance. So getting back to the question, I think BCS does have a role to play. And this is one of the things I've been certainly been championing in trying to get a more balanced approach Trying to get that into academia and education is there's another challenge there. And one of the conversations I've had in this space has been where um, academia has basically come back with the response of saying, well, because there's no research money in it, we're not gonna, we're not, we don't cover it. And I think that kind of misses the point that whilst academia research is one part of the role, uh, education is the other. And if we've got graduates coming out of universities without a, a without the appropriate balance of skills, then education potentially needs to look at maybe broadening itself or covering other areas to make sure there is the appropriate coverage. So slightly a slight long rambling conversation there. I tried not to get too much on my soapbox, but I think, yeah, it, it is a, a particular challenge. I think uh, BCS does have a role to play in that. Okay, interesting. Uh, um, Mark, just out of interest, do you, would you concur with that? Do you have any any thoughts to add on the education side? I, I think so. I think um, you know, pe people come at it from from different directions, but they always end up at the same place in, when it comes to to data and data management. Um, for various reasons, you know, you 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 come to the conclusion that um, that there really is no substitute for understanding um, what data you have, um, what it means, how it was collected. Um, what quality it is, how well you can trust it, um, and, and just you know, documenting and, and, and defining what it is you have, what you're doing with it, 
um, and whether or not you believe in it, um, you know, it becomes the, the core of, of, of all data management activities. Now, a lot of people come to this um, after several years in their career of having done various jobs. And you know, I'm, I'm always amazed to hear people's stories about you know, how they got into data management in the first place because there's so many different routes in. Um, but they all come back to the point where they, there's this light bulb moment when they go, and then I realized that actually getting the data right is the most important thing that we do. Um, and I hear that again, and, and it would be really nice to, to, to sort of put that in earlier in people's experience. So, so get into the universities um, and, and explain that, you know, you know, because let's face it, there's not going to be less data in the future. There's going to be more of it. Mm. Um, you know, so, so to, to get that, that message across earlier, to, to, to give people that shortcut, like at some point you are going to, re- you are going to understand that, or you're going to dis- discover that you're wrestling with data and trying to get it under control. And actually, you know, there's a lot of knowledge out there of, of how this can be done. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm all for educating them, catching them young. Yeah, I think building what Mark was saying there around data quality, I think there's also a mindset change people need to go for. So I liken it to being comparing metalwork to woodwork. And I think too many people in this space think it's a bit like making a piece of metal furniture. So you, you've got the material, it's come from the supply, you've got the quality conformance certificate. So your main challenge is how best we use this in the most efficient way. If you're thinking more about woodwork, the joiners probably kind of have to look at the piece of wood to work out which way is the grain going? What's the, have I got any knots in the wood that I need to take account of? There's the bits where there's a bit of woodworm or a bit of rock, and we therefore need to use the wood in a slightly different way to make a piece of furniture. And I think that mindset of understanding the nature of the data to then work out how best we use it, I think is really, really key. And I think it's a really good example. So when Mark and I first met, was in a conference in Belgium quite a few years ago now, with, where you've been working with a electricity distributor over in Belgium. And I think your tales there about how when they started to realize what data could do for them, it suddenly changed the, 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 the nature of the discussion to being one a lot more data engaged. I mean, do you want to touch on that, Mark? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And I, I see this, you know, not just in, in, in from that experience, but again and again, um, is I, I, I use the expression um, organizational confidence. Um, and you go from a, a point where no one really believes the data or, or you, you, you spend time, you waste time in, in meetings um, arguing over who's got the right numbers um, to a point where you actually, you know, everyone understands that those numbers are right um, because we've validated them and we have confidence in them. And we, we're now talking about what they mean um, and, and what we're going to do with it. And, and, and that degree of organizational, it's, it's palpable. You can, you can almost, you can feel it in, in, in an organization um, when, when people, they, they trust their data, they understand it, they've got, you know, they've increased their levels of data literacy. So they're having conversations which are really meaningful and they're digging into the details of, of why things are happening, why things are going right, why are they going wrong, where the best um, opportunities are for improvement and for serving customers or citizens better. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's really, like I say, it, it's almost, it's almost, you can almost taste it in an organization. Interesting. I think that also going back to the conference, one of the things that we've, um, People are sort of very familiar with data science is the new sort of the, the rock star discipline in this space where the uh, tales of mega salaries and all the rest of it. But there's also various tales and uh, evidence to say that between 70 and 90 percent of the data scientist's time is spent trying to wrestle the data in a format when they can start using these rock star skills. And so actually two of our speakers over the week, it's going to be interesting to get their side. One is Stuart Kidney from the National Physical Laboratory. So he heads up their data science discipline so he can touch a little bit more about what they're doing to understand and make use of the data uh, but also on the friday we've got nick soros of data kind who, who explain a little bit more about what they do as uh, a not-for-profit sort of using pro bono time from data scientists to actually help deliver outputs for various charitable um, concerns so um, another couple of areas that we're going to be touching on in this virtual conference and in, in the week that we've got Excellent. And uh, a couple more questions have come in as well. Uh, um, let, me, let me put you, these to you. Jeremy Goodban has said this. Do you feel that data governance, including GDPR skills, are well represented in the SOFIA framework? Um, so this is another education question, uh, Julian. Perhaps I'll put that one to you. Um, it's an interesting topic that you've come up with there because there is a, a, a joint initiative between a number of the professional bodies where it includes BCS, the... Um, Royal Statistical Society, the Operational Research Society, the Royal Academy of Engineering. Uh, Royal so there's a number of these bodies trying to look at how we professionalise data science. 
And one of the areas that has been looked at is in terms of the SOFIA framework. Mm. And that is looking at a number of things. So data is covered in SOFIA, but it's potentially not covered to quite the right depth. And there are some, some of the areas where it's potentially on the boundaries of SOFIA into some of the softer skills that maybe need a little bit more coverage. Um, but um, I know that there's some work at the moment looking at upgrading and, and refining and improving Sophia. So somewhere, I'm not sure exactly where, but on the BCS website, if people are interested in that, there are, there's a call for volunteers to help work developing and improving some of those definitions. Um, but I think it is something, I, I think there's both the Sophia framework, but I think there's also the wider organisational understanding of the need. So if data governance professionals are all in violent agreement with each other, these are the things that we need to do, but the leaders of the organization haven't quite got on, got, got their head around the fact that data governance is actually something that they should be doing. It's a value to the organization. Um, there is still some, mind, some, 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 some changing of minds needed, potentially the leaders of organizations to realize that in this more data-driven world that we're in, Data governance is a key part of that, and we need to make sure that we've got appropriate representation in organisations. I think it's probably fair to say that um, disciplines need to have a certain level of maturity before they are usefully used in the SOFIA framework anyway, don't they? So uh, maybe with that, that part of the journey, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure, but that would make sense to me. Uh, Nigel sent another question in for us. Would the panel consider mandatory data protection impact assessments for all new projects? Mark? Um, well, it's certainly something that um, that I, I'm used to. So, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm well used to to filling in DPIAs um, for for the for the customer for the work that, that I do. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's it, it's very much a habit. I think um, certainly, yes, I, I would be in favour. Uh, one of the things I would um, advise though is um, it doesn't always have to be onerous. Um, I think um, you know being able to you know if if you if you're making small changes. Um, you know, being able to demonstrate that you have thought about data protection, you've had a look at it and you think actually in this instance, um, there are no data protection issues. Having Just having that trace um, can, can be all you need. Um, but, you know, when you do um, this, again, it's about showing you're working. You know, it, 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 these, these things are, are important. And, um, you know, the, the, the risk of not doing a data protection impact assessment is, um, you, you know, you, you, you make some big mistakes. You, you leave big gaps and you leave yourself wide open. Um, so yeah, you know, yes, the simple question, simple answer is yes. I think mandatory DPIA is, is a good idea. Um, but what I would warn against is, um, you know, it doesn't have to be overly burdensome. So if you're implementing them, um, you know, make sure make it make sure it's appropriate. If you have a problem with the IC, I, I presume that sort of thing would show some measure of due diligence and 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 good intent, Julian. Well, yeah, and I was going to expand on Mark's uh, answer there that I think it's a little bit wider than just the data privacy aspect is if you're dealing with security activities, there's, there's a whole range of things. So I think people do need to be going in and, the, and your comments about due diligence I think it is, is, is really relevant. I think mandatory sometimes might be viewed as too much of a sledgehammer to crack a nut. But I think for organisations to recognise that they have a role to play, they have to demonstrate due diligence and that there's an appropriate level of planning and thinking before in, engaging in a, in a transformation or a technology type project, um, that is really important. And it needs to cover all aspects, not just the privacy aspect, but also security. There might be some intellectual property issues. There might be a whole range of issues that need to be thought through. And also within organizations, I mean, Mark and I are very familiar with you, you, you go into an organization and you look at what have you got and where is it? There's the stuff that IT look after. And then there's all the Excel spreadsheets um, and everything else as well. And that, that's typical of most organizations. And we need to help people get a little bit more savvy in realizing that they need to look from an organizational perspective at what have we got, where is it? How do we manage it in the most appropriate way? And if we're planning a project, we don't just necessarily look at the old system where we're replacing, but let's look at also the spreadsheets that are around it and the working practices that have adapted to work around shortcomings of the software. Um, we need to be a little bit more savvy at doing the planning to make sure then we've got a better path throughout a project. Thanks. Interesting. Surely there's no problems that can't be solved uh, with a spreadsheet. Uh, Julian. We <laughs> love spreadsheets, don't we? Marjorie just oh, yeah. sent a message. It shows due diligence with the ICO if you can produce a DPIA. It's really like Mark's answer. So thank you, Mark. Sorry, Julian. Um, 
Yes, I mean, I think one goes to the efficiency and effectiveness angle. So yes, you could do everything in Excel, um, but you wouldn't necessarily be a world leading, world beating organization if you did that. And sometimes there is a need for, I mean, I think Excel is a great as an analysis tool. It is great to give you that flexibility of getting a view on your data, but I think it can start to get a bit dangerous where in a large enterprise, somebody's taken that dump of data and then they start adding an extra couple of columns to it because they think it'd be useful to source some more data. And then suddenly your data landscape has just got a bit more fragmented because you've got yet another version of the truth. And the more people do that, the harder it is for people to understand what's going on with their organization. One client I had a, a year ago, they got an issue where a lot of their engineers' time was spent trying to go through and look at all the different variants of information about a particular facility to work out which was the most up-to-date one because they didn't know. And so that inefficiency they've built into every single project because they haven't thought through about what their data architecture is and what it should be. And funny enough, I'm thinking of track and trace. So I don't know why that's coming to my mind. But, uh, oh. there is, if, if, I, if I can just add, actually, that my, my favourite um, Excel wisdom um, it came from a, a finance director I used to, to work for uh, many years ago, and he had two immutable laws on, on Excel. Um, and, and the law number one was um, the only person who actually understands how an Excel spreadsheet works is the person who created it. Um, and rule number two was every single Excel spreadsheet has at least one error in it. Um, and I've yet to see um, examples where his, his rules have been broken. Mm. <laughs> That's well, interesting. I, I, I can actually build on that. So there's some work I did with the council a few years ago. It was interesting that we were partnering with a, an organization doing a, a BI solution. And they, the way the council had run around a particular area around statutory reporting was each team would report their bit and pass their answer on to the next team in the chain. And so what was happening is people rounding up, rounding down, justifying, making it the answer they could. And when the BI solution was being piloted and they actually went from the source, put, applied the right calculation from the source, the organisation found that they're actually significantly underreporting on quite a serious measure because everybody had been rounding up and down. And I think that lack of visibility, lack of awareness of what happens when you don't take that overall holistic view, I think is, is really, really important. That's interesting. Uh, thanks ever so much. Um, we've got two minutes left. That's how fast it's gone by. Um, so thank you, first of all, uh, to all our participants for their questions. Really interesting questions. We had one more that was sent in in advance. Uh, Andrew Black sent this in. I'm just going to put this to you. Um, but th this might be something that gets picked up at the, or an example of what might get picked up at, at the conference. What can what can be done to ensure privacy rules actually have the effect intended? For example, the health servers are so keen not to allow staff access to your personal data that you end up having to give answers multiple times, sometimes in front of other patients. Any thoughts on, uh, that's very specific, but it perhaps mm -hmm. shows an issue. Mark? Uh, again, I, th I think this means that actually you need the, the privacy laws need to be interpreted um, yeah. and in, in a healthcare setting. You know, there, I, I don't see any reason why in, in a single organization um, that um, patient data should not be shared. You, uh, you know, uh, hospitals and, and healthcare professionals um, are also obliged, you know, they have the duty of care obligations um, and you, know, you can be failing your duty of care by not sharing information. Um, so I think, again, this, this comes back to the, the, this, everything needs, all the guidelines need to be translated into something practical for people who are on the ground. Um, and, and that's where we, as, as data management professionals, really can and should add value. Excellent. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Julian, any closing thoughts? Um, well, I'll just build on that. And so I'm going back to two of the answers we gave earlier. One is that as professionals, we need to be a little bit more of the data sherpas, guiding people through this minefield. And two, it's recognising there is that balance, that the easy binary answer of lock everything down so people can't share the information has a big impact on the efficiency of the organisation, but also the morale of the staff. If they feel that they can't get what they need to do their job, they're actually going to be struggling and you've, you've got a real morale issue. Whereas if you can get a more appropriate level of sharing, appropriate level of security, then it should facilitate a far better interaction with, with patients or customers. And also it should be far better for the staff involved in running that particular system. Lovely. Thank you. Well, um, Julian Schwarzenberg, Mark Humphries, can I say thank you so much uh, for your answers? Can I thank the audience for their questions? Really interesting questions too. We've had a good chat. We'll look forward to the uh, full conference. Details are on the BCS website. Um, and I think that is the moment to bring our discussion to conclusion. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Brian. Yeah.